Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak at report stage. I understand I'm speaking to my amendments that were the deletion amendments and the substantive amendments that I put forward still await a ruling, Mr. Speaker. Um, as I have the floor now, I just in brief response to the point made by the government house leader that he was somehow caught unaware by my point of order. I've checked with my staff and checked for the numbers of times that the government house leader has risen on points of order directed at restricting my rights as a member of parliament and I haven't received any advance notice from the government house leader. Not that I was in any way suggesting tit for tat, but I did not realize it was a convention of this place to give the government house leader more notice of my points of order than he has ever given me. Uh, turning to the substance of Bill C-59, and I appreciate the remarks from my friend from Skeena Bulkley Valley, uh, the, the substance of this bill needs to be put forward again clearly that this is an omnibus budget bill once again. C'est un projet de loi omnibus budgétaire avec les, les changements dans 20 uh, lois du Canada, 20 choses absolument tout à fait différentes l'un de l'autre. So there's no single unifying purpose, which is the underlying principle of why we would ever have omnibus legislation in this country. The use of omnibus budget bills is just as the use of time allocation under this administration unprecedented in Canadian parliamentary history. We have never had any other administration ever put forward so much legislation through the form of omnibus budget bills with sections that are unrelated to each other and equally unrelated to the budget. This one is not as, as lengthy as others, certainly C-38 at over 400 pages, followed that fall by C-45 at over 400 pages, or in earlier times when, when the Conservatives were in minority and they brought forward 800 pages of omnibus budget legislation in 2008, and I think it was over 900 pages in 2009. So in terms of page length, uh, this one is at 100 and, uh, and just under 160 pages, uh, less lengthy, but it's no less complex than previous omnibus budget bills, and as a result, it's had inadequate study. It got pushed through committee and pushed through this place with time allocation at every stage. So in looking at it in any level of detail, Mr. Speaker, I, I think it's worth reviewing with other members of this House, because we've had so little time to study it, how many different sections of laws are affected by this. It affects parliamentary precinct security, and that's one thing I want to return to because it's a, a fundamental and very important constitutional question of who's in charge of security in this place. It changes Personal Information and Protection Electronic Documents Act, or PEPIDA. It changes, and this is actually a, a good piece of legislation we've been waiting for for some time, amendments to the First Nations Fiscal Management Act, which really deserved its own care and attention through this place. The changes to Trust and Loan Committee, uh, Companies Act, changes to the Public uh, Sector Labor Relations Act, which are extra, uh, quite egregious in that they preempt collective bargaining. I'll stop at this point just to say this preempts collective bargaining to make changes to sick leave provisions for our very hardworking federal civil servants. Uh, the changes that occurred to the National Energy Board Act changed the maximum duration of licenses for, natural, for ex exportation of, nat uh, of natural gas issued under the NEB Act. It goes on and on, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the number of distinct and different pieces of legislation, none with a relation to each other, none, I repeat, none receiving adequate study. Just one anecdote, Mr. Speaker, on a previous omnibus budget bill, I presented amendments at committee, and it wasn't until I presented the amendments that the committee realized that there had been no witnesses on that particular section, none of the committee members remembered having read it, and therefore my amendments couldn't be adequately discussed because nobody really knew about that section of the omnibus bill. There were just too many sections to give adequate care and attention. So let me just touch on some of the ones that are concerning. I think it, you, I, I certainly was concerned to see the changes to the Copyright Act. These are changes that benefit the music industry, particularly the large U.S. companies, not the songwriters and not the musicians of Canada, by changing the copyright for a song recording to 50 to 70 years. There are also changes in Division 9, 
Mr. Speaker, that, uh, again, I mentioned these briefly, but without describing them. The natural gas exportation license will be extended to 40 years, up from 25. It's a quite significant change. It was opposed in committee by the witnesses from West Coast Environmental Law, who said that, uh, you know, of course, and I'll just quote from their testimony, it is quite possible that something thought to be a good idea today may not in 25 years' time, with the advent of climate change, economic shifts, and an increasingly harmed environment, and other potentially unforeseen alterations in the landscape, be considered a good idea in 40 years' time. Uh, the, these are significant changes that did not receive enough study. Uh, but, and there are also, we heard from the member from Skeena Bulkley Valley, and I completely agree, that the precarious nature of, of interns working in the federal civil service, and I think all parties have at various times said that we wanted to do something to ensure that unpaid internships uh, uh, and, and student work within the government be protected properly. The Act says it's going to go in that direction, but as the submission from the Canadian Intern Association made clear, very much more needs to be done if these workers are not to be exploited in the system. And given the time I have at the moment, Mr. Speaker, I'll move on to other areas of the bill that really should ha have had greater study. The biometrics piece is one that came out with witness testimony uh, at the very last minute, actually on the morning that we moved to clause by clause, we realized how sweeping the changes are in terms of collecting biometric information. They might even apply to people who want to come here as tourists, given the changes that were made in fall of 2012 in Bill C-55, where now even tur people seeking uh, to come here on vacation, if they're not in a country that requires a visa, these potential tourists will also have to apply to the Ministry of Immigration for permission to come to Canada. The sweeping nature of the changes under biometrics information could, in fact, apply to tourists, even though I don't believe that's the government's intent. So let me just make sure that in the three minutes remaining, I concentrate on the two most egregious changes in Bill C-59. I mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, the change in terms of security for the parliamentary precinct. This is, there couldn't be a more serious issue for those of us assembled in this place. We had the attack, the tragic murder of Nathan Cirillo on October 22nd, and what could have been a far more devastating tragedy had not the security team of the House of Commons uh, if, and the RCMP and the Ottawa police acted as they did and ended that crisis. I think the, the conclusion that's being reached that we need a unified security team is exactly right. We do need to ensure that the outside grounds and the inside of Parliament are all protected by people who are in one unified system. The large question, and one that's been rushed through this place without adequate study, is which of the security agencies should be in control. It is deeply embedded in parliamentary tradition. My first reference to this that I could find goes back to the year 1500. It is deeply embedded in parliamentary tradition that you, Mr. Speaker, are the person and the entity and the office that protects the security of the members here. A change to allow the RCMP, who ultimately report to the Prime Minister or to the executive part of government, is a fundamental change that is unconstitutional, but because of the privileges that surround Parliament itself, it's unlikely we'll be able to challenge this in a court ever. So it should not be rushed to this place. It's a fundamental change in the relationship between the Speaker, the members of Parliament who look to the Speaker for the protection of our rights, and the risk, and I'm not going to suggest it exists with any particular Prime Minister, that there could be an abuse of that authority to impede the access to this place based on party membership. I think we have a significant risk that remains for potential future Prime Ministers if we do not change this, Mr. Speaker. The last point I want to raise is, of course, best expressed in the words of the Information Commissioner of Canada herself. These are changes to undo laws now in effect. And what she said is, quote, 
these proposed changes would retroactively quash Canadians' right of access and the government's obligations under the Access to Information Act. It will effectively erase history. It is not an attempt to close a loophole, but rather it is an attempt to create a black hole. Such changes should not be allowed in any democracy, Mr. Speaker, and C-59 should therefore be defeated. Questions and comments? Questione commentai, the Honourable Member for Skeena, Buckley Valley. Thank you, thank you Mr. Speaker, and a, a question for my friend from Saanich. It's, um, it's interesting with these, these omnibus bills that are notionally attached to the budget, that we spend so much of our time talking about non-budget things because that's the majority of what sits in the bill, and that is true also for this bill, C-59, 150 pages and 270 different clauses changing all sorts of laws and rules. The vast majority have nothing to do with the Canadian economy. Now, you would wonder if a government was actually interested in you know, helping out Canadians who are out of work, the 1.3 million odd Canadians, the, the youth unemployment rate, which is a point and a half higher than it was a year ago, and having more than 16 months of terrible growth rates in Canada, never mind the innovation gap. But the Prime Minister recently committed to decarbonizing uh, the Canadian economy in 85 years' time. Uh, I'm wondering what my friend's assessment is, because there's been a global surge in clean tech investments, outpacing investments in carbon uh, energy, globally speaking, and many of the provinces and cities have moved forward in Canada. Yet the lack of leadership, the lack of thoughtfulness at all about this pressing environmental concern is only surpassed by the ignorance towards the economic opportunities that exist for Canadians to retrofit their homes, to move to and from work in more environmentally friendly ways, to go to work at places that are more conscious of our impact on the planet. So my question is of a financial nature, yet wedded within uh, the, the ecological questions that we all must ask ourselves. So the, the PM's now committed that he thinks carbon is a problem and he's going to do something about it, or not him, excuse me, 85 years from now someone's going to do something about it. But I'm wondering just the assessment from my friend as to Canada's performance to this point in getting on board that light rail train of uh, opportunity that is expressed by the clean tech sector globally. Member for Sandwich, Gulf Island. Well, I thank my honourable friend from Skeena, Bulkley Valley. Uh, my assessment is that we've missed that train. That train's out of the station. Last year, and this, he raises a very important point, Mr. Speaker, last year, 2014, was the first year in terms of global finance ever that the investments in clean tech and renewables outpaced investments in fossil fuels. Uh, this particular administration has misjudged marketplace and failed to diversify. The putting your eggs in the bitumen basket strategy has created the uh, economic uncertainties that, uh, that the finance ministry used as the excuse for delaying his budget. I don't think that we were ever as dependent on bitumen as the propaganda would want us to believe. The oil sands, while important, contribute only 2% to our GDP. Small business in Canada contributes 30%. So while I do applaud the fact that Prime Minister has finally accepted a communique that uses the word decarbonization, I lament the fact that Canada's recalcitrance and objections at the summit in Germany led to the G7 weakening its timetable to get us to where the world needs to be in a post-fossil economy. Questions and comments? Question commentai, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I'm wondering if I can pick up on the Leader of the Green Party's uh, comments at the beginning where she's talking about uh, how it is that we have, in essence, uh, a legislative agenda in good part being incorporated into a budget uh, document and uh, the loss of opportunity to provide uh, diligence uh, by having what would be separate pieces of uh, legislation uh, coming before the House where it would in fact be uh, properly uh, debated. Uh, con uh, individual experts would be afforded the opportunity to be able to come during a second or uh, committee stage uh, so that we can in fact have good solid uh, legislation that quite often 
there is merit for something that's within that budget legislation that would be great for standalone uh, as a piece of legislation. And by doing it in the manner in which this government has, has done it, it's really deprived Canadian the opportunity to have a, a good, sound, robust uh, system that would ensure that we have uh, good legislation. Recognizing, of course, that uh, all governments of all political stripes at different levels do at times incorporate legislation into uh, budget bills. The Honourable Member for Standish Gulf Islands, we're almost out of time. A short answer, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Winnipeg North, and I will make this brief, allows me to point out that under this Conservative administration, the treatment of legislation through this House amounts to contempt of Parliament. A serious series of abuses, from use of omnibus budget bills to time allocations to converting what used to be a very consensual, nonpartisan study of bills in parliamentary committees into a scripted, whipped vote process in which amendments that should be accepted because they even represent misunderstandings or typographical errors, these even clerical errors were pushed through in, in bills such as C-38. It is, in fact, a contempt of Parliament.